thanks for the introduction, Hugh. I'm pretty excited to be able to learn from God's Word with all of you today. Why don't we start by praying to our God. Heavenly Father, for these next few minutes, uh, please help us to listen carefully to your Word. Help us to understand your message to us and to respond in obedience, whatever that looks like. Uh, give me your grace to be clear and helpful. We pray this in your Son's precious name. Amen. So when you think of a real spiritual leader, I wonder what comes to mind. Maybe the Dalai Lama meditating in the mountains, or Pope Francis sitting on the chair of St. Peter. I searched on Google for the top 10 spiritual leaders of our world, and the man who tops the list is Deepak Chopra, who is described as a pioneer in personal transformation. And he's recently written a book called Metahuman, Unleashing Your Infinite Potential, where Deepak, quote, unlocks the secrets to moving beyond our present limitation to access a field of infinite possibilities. Wow. Maybe in comparison to that, you think our spiritual leaders here, our ministers, Tim and Hugh, look a bit ordinary. That all Christian ministers seem a bit ordinary. I mean, every week they front the church, they care for us. But all they seem to talk about is a very old book called the Bible, and some bloke called Jesus who just can't seem to die every week. Bible, Jesus, Bible, Jesus. Maybe you're thinking that they've got it wrong, that they should be talking about something more exciting, something more mysterious, something more deep patch style. What does it look like to be a real Christian minister? If you have these questions, you're not alone. In fact, the Christian Colossians, to whom this letter from Paul was addressed, were wrestling with similar questions. You see, they were trying to work out who the real Christian ministers were. In one camp, you had Paul and his mate Epaphras, and they were the ones who had given the Colossians the original good news about Jesus. Then on the other side, you had these new teachers, and they had come in later, saying that Jesus wasn't enough, that to get the real spiritual experience, you need special secret knowledge that only they could provide. So you can imagine why the Colossians were getting confused. Both camps were claiming to be Christian ministers, but who's teaching our message? And what makes a Christian minister legitimate anyway? And so Paul writes this letter to try and clear things up for the Colossians. And in today's passage, what we're going to see is Paul address this question of what a real Christian minister is supposed to look like, what they're supposed to do, what they're supposed to say. And he does this by talking about his own role as a spiritual leader to the Colossians. Paul draws our attention to three things in today's passage. Firstly, his condition. Secondly, his message. And thirdly, his goal. In order for us to understand the role of a Christian minister. Let's start by considering Paul's commission. Simply put, God has commissioned Paul to preach God's word in its fullness to the church. And we see that pretty plainly in verse 25, where Paul tells us, I have become its servant in the church by the commission God gave me to present to you, the Colossians, the word of God in its fullness. Now, we're probably tempted to think that sounds pretty ordinary. But Paul wants us to know that that couldn't be further from the truth. That a Christian minister's most important role is to fully present God's word. In fact, it is so important that Paul says it is worth rejoicing and suffering for, and that it in a very real way completes Christ's own suffering. Let me say that again. Fully preaching God's word is so important that it is worth rejoicing and suffering for, and when done faithfully, completes Christ's sufferings. Now this is the point where you say, hold on, that is outrageous. Sure, Paul's job is to preach the word of God, okay, got that. He's saying it's so important that Paul can suffer joyfully for it. Okay, that's a stretch, but Paul's a bit of a strange person, so okay. But that by preaching the word of God, Paul can somehow complete Christ's suffering? How can that be possible? And why does Christ's suffering need completing anyway? Does Paul really say that? 
Let's take a close look at verse 24 together to find it out. So we read, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. So I being Paul and you being the Colossians, and I thought my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. First we notice that Paul is rejoicing in his suffering, which is pretty unusual in itself. Most normal people do not rejoice in their suffering. So that tells us there must be some great purpose or meaning that Paul attaches to his experience of suffering. And we find out what that is, because Paul then goes on to say what he suffers, that when he suffers, he believes that he is somehow making up for a deficiency or lacking in Christ's afflictions. And we think to ourselves, what could possibly be lacking in Christ's afflictions? Paul himself tells us earlier in the same letter that Christ is supreme, and that his death on the cross offers full reconciliation. So how can his suffering be lacking? We're given a clue at the end of verse 24 that this suffering of Paul, which somehow completes Christ's suffering, is for the sake of his body, which is the church. So what's Paul's relationship to the church? Well, from verse 25, which we've already looked at, we remember that Paul has been commissioned by God to serve the church by presenting to it the word of God in its fullness. And so if we put it all together, we see that when Paul suffers for fulfilling his commission, which is to preach the word of God, this is the way in which he completes Christ's suffering and fills up what is lacking. So when Paul talks about what's lacking in Christ's suffering, he isn't saying that it's incomplete in terms of salvation. He's saying it's incomplete in terms of presentation. That even though Christ's suffering is sufficient to save everyone, the message of his suffering still needs to be presented to people so they can hear and understand and believe and be saved. And that is where Paul comes in. That is why he has been commissioned by God. In fact, that is why any Christian minister is commissioned by God. So they can present this message, the word of God in its fullness, which ultimately shows Christ. And when a Christian minister does this faithfully, even in the face of suffering, then that's the real deal. They're being a real spiritual leader. But what about for us? Most of us aren't ministers or pastors of a church. Does this apply to us too? I think it does. Whilst we might, we might not be ministers, we're all involved in ministering to those around us. If we're a Christian and we have relationships with people around us, then we have opportunities for ministry. And if Paul is saying that the Word of God is at the very heart of his commission as a minister, then we also need to find ways to bring the Bible into our relationships with others to create ministry opportunities. That might be memorizing a short verse, and having a conversation with a friend about it. They might be inviting a family member to catch up and read a chapter of the Bible. They might be doing some storytelling from the Bible for younger children. And you know what? Doing these things might be a bit uncomfortable for us. It might be awkward. It might cost us relationships. It might cost us time, money, our jobs. We may suffer. In fact, Jesus himself tells us that anyone who follows in his footsteps should expect to suffer. But Paul reminds us that there is no higher privilege than suffering for Jesus and with Jesus. So whatever it may look like, let's do our best to bring God's word into our interaction with others. So we've looked at Paul's condition and seen how being a real Christian minister means fulfilling his God-given responsibility to present God's word to the church. But that begs the question, what exactly is the content of this word of God? What is the message of the Christian minister? So now to point to Paul's message. Paul's message is a person, the person of Jesus Christ. And not Jesus Christ as some far off, sort of distant, aloof figure, but Jesus Christ in you, in me, in everyone. It is an invitation from God extended to every person on this planet to have a personal relationship with his son, Jesus Christ, and share in his glory. That is the message of the real Christian minister. So what Paul says in verse 27. To them, the church, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
Paul is emphasizing here that what makes this message, this mystery, so glorious and rich is the fact that it is so incredibly inclusive. It even includes the Gentiles. And nowadays, we live in a culture where inclusiveness is expected, which makes it harder for us to appreciate what Paul is saying. But I want to remind us that in the time of history before Jesus, it was the Jews who were God's exclusively chosen people. If you were a Jew, that was a massive deal. It meant that you were part of God's family. It meant that you were included in all of God's promises. It meant that you had a special relationship with God. And on the flip side, if you weren't a Jew, which is what being a Gentile meant, that you were non-Jewish, then that was really bad news. That meant you were excluded from God's family, excluded from His promises, and that you had no connection with God. Now, I'm not a Jew. Uh, I'm from Hong Kong, so I'm a Gentile. And I'm guessing most of you probably aren't Jewish, which means you're also Gentiles. And interestingly, most of the Colossians weren't Jewish either. So they were also Gentiles. So none of us were originally a part of God's chosen people. But now, Paul says, because of what Jesus has done in his life, his death and resurrection, we are all invited to have a personal relationship with Jesus, to be part of God's family and share in all his blessings. This is the astounding message of the Christian minister. When we hear something like this, I wonder how it is we respond. Maybe this is the first time you've ever heard anything like this, and you're excited, you're thinking, how is this possible? How is it possible that the God of the universe would want to invite me into his family, me with all my selfishness and pride and brokenness? How is it possible that Jesus would want to come into my life? If that's you, praise God, that's amazing. Don't lose that excitement. Talk to someone about it right after this. Talk to the person next to you. Talk to me. Talk to anyone. Just keep searching until you get the answer to that question. Or maybe you're a Christian already. You're trusting in Jesus. And when you hear this, you're thinking, wow, I've, I've forgotten what a big deal this is. Me, a Gentile, dead in my sins, born into God's family, like Jesus' death in my place on the cross, made alive with him at his resurrection, and now I have the hope of sharing in Jesus' glory. There's so much I haven't thought through, so much I haven't given thanks for. I need to go back and soak up the richness of this good news. If that's you, I said the same thing. Praise God. That's amazing. Don't lose that excitement. Go back to the Bible and feast on its goodness. Talk to your brothers and sisters in the church. Talk to me. Encourage us and get us excited as well. Or maybe, just maybe, you're someone who has heard this so many times before that you're just not very excited at all. Same thing, I know this already. Jesus lived, he died, came back to life, rose to heaven. It's the same thing. I wonder if some of the Colossians were also starting to think in the same way. And that's why when a new teacher, a teaching that promised more than Jesus, special knowledge and spirituality outside of Jesus came along. They jumped at it. Paul, he loved the Colossians. He cared for them so much, which is why he didn't want them to be deceived. He knew that the biggest mistake they could make in their lives was to think that there was something more than Jesus, something more valuable, something more spiritual, something more rich. Paul is saying, no, not in a million years. Knowing Christ is the most experience any human can ever hope to pursue. See what Paul says about Christ in chapter 2 verse 3. Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Not just a bit of them, not just some of them, but all of them. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge to be had in heaven and on earth are in Christ. You see, Paul knew the problem wasn't that Jesus somehow lacked depth or richness or fullness. The problem, if any, is with the Colossians. It's with all of us. It's with our attitudes towards understanding Christ. Which is why Paul's job wasn't just to deliver the message of Christ to the Colossians. He also had a goal for them. A destination. Somewhere he wanted them to end up. And this is a goal that every Christian minister has for the congregation. That we might all become fully mature in Christ. So now to point three, Paul's goal. We read in verse 28 to 29. 
He, He being Christ, is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Paul tells us that as a Christian minister, all his efforts go into proclaiming Jesus, correcting and teaching with the goal of presenting everyone fully mature in Christ. And you know what? That's exactly what our Christian ministers do for us here. It might look pretty ordinary to the world, but Tim, Hugh, Lucy, all our Christian leadership, they pour their time and energy into proclaiming Christ, telling us about what he has done, what he is still doing, what that means for our lives, gently correcting us when our understanding is wrong, challenging us to take things seriously and live with Jesus as our King and Savior. Praise God for the Christian ministers he has blessed us with. So that's what they're doing, but what about us? What are we doing? You see, no amount of external teaching, correcting, or admonishing is going to do anything if we don't have a heart to understand, a desire to know more. And that's what Paul shows us in chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. He says, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those of Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. Notice in verse 1, Paul actually tells the Colossians how hard he's working for them. He's not trying to keep that a secret. And the reason for that is in verse 2. He wants them to be encouraged by his efforts and respond to the love he is showing them by uniting with him in this goal he has for them. Paul knows that it is a team effort, that in order to reach the riches of complete understanding, you need both a minister to teach and proclaim the word of God, but you also need motivated and encouraged listeners who are willing to put in the hard yards to understand. And notice that for Paul, understanding is a crucial step. You can't know Christ or have maturity in Christ without personal understanding. And that is our responsibility and our privilege as Christians, to understand Christ in us. And the more we do this, the more we will grow in maturity in Christ. Think about it like this. Imagine you are looking for gold. You come across a massive seam of gold in the ground that runs for kilometers deep. In fact, you don't know how deep it goes. It's pure gold, and you're amazed. And you think, man, this ground here is so rich in gold. Now, just because you've found some gold in the ground, does that mean that you are now personally rich in gold? Well, no. Doesn't matter how rich the ground is in gold, as long as the gold stays in the ground, you're not rich at all. You need to build a mine and start digging up the gold and extracting it and refining it. And once you've taken the gold out of the ground and into your home, then you are rich in gold. And that's the same thing with Christ. In Christ are all the riches of knowledge and wisdom. But as long as we stand far off and uninterested and uninvolved, we will remain poor. But if we get close and personal and start to dig, when we start to process and take in the riches of Christ, then we will become rich in understanding and our lives will be transformed. So what does that look like for us? I want to encourage us to seriously ask ourselves, are we satisfied with our understanding of Christ in us? If a friend of ours asked us, what does it mean for Jesus to be in you? It sounds really weird. Will we be able to explain clearly and helpfully what that means. But we'd be able to explain why Jesus' incarnation into our world as a baby was so important. Why his perfect life was so important. Why his miracles were so important. Why his death was so important. Why his resurrection was so important. Why his ascension was so important. How deeply do we know our King and Savior, Jesus? Friends, it's all in here. The richness of Christ, ours for the taking. Can we commit to digging deep every day so that we can reach maturity in Christ? Can we commit to digging deep with our brothers and sisters in growth teams so we can reach maturity in Christ together? Can we commit to coming to church and sitting under the teaching of the ministers that God has commissioned for us so we can reach maturity in Christ? Friends, we started today 
by thinking about what a real spiritual leader looks like. And even though our Christian ministers here might not seem too flashy, they are the real deal because they are doing exactly what God has commissioned them to do. In today's passage, Paul has shown us what really matters in a Christian minister. Firstly, the commission itself to fully present God's word, even in the face of suffering. And I hope we've been challenged to do the same, to bring the Bible into our relationships, no matter the cost. Secondly, the message, God's personal invitation to know Christ his Son and share his glory, this invitation that is extended to all people, both Jew and Gentile. And I hope that we'll never stop being excited about the glorious richness of this message that brings us Gentiles into God's family. And finally, the minister's goal, that us, the congregation, might be fully mature. And I hope that we will res respond to the efforts of our ministers by committing our own efforts, time and resources, to fully understanding Christ, our King. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for commissioning faithful Christian ministers in our church. By your spirit and power, enable them to preach your word fully, to show us Christ clearly, and to bring us to maturity. Lord, humble us, make us teachable, and instill in our hearts a real desire to know your Son deeply, your Son who has saved us from sin, and in whom are all the riches of wisdom and knowledge. We pray this in your Son's precious name.